watercolour materials for beginners. In this video, I'm going to give you a better idea of how watercolour works. I'm going to look at the properties of watercolour paints just so you understand them a little bit better. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle. On this channel, you'll find lots of watercolour tips and techniques, including colour mixing, even a little bit of mixed media work and some business training for artists. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell notification, you can get notified as soon as I have a new video for you. I make one free video a week on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for my Patreon subscribers on Saturdays. So when you first start watercolour painting, it can be really confusing. Not only have you got dozens of brands, you've got hundreds of colours in each brand, and then you hear all of these other words like granulation, transparency, staining pigments, and you've no idea really what's going on, and it just seems like a whole big confusing mass of information. So what I'm going to do in this video is break down 10 of the properties of watercolour paints it's far more about pigments than it is about individual brands. I'm going to explain it all to you so that you'll understand a lot more about the paints that you're buying and the paints that you're using. And let's get started because I'm just gonna make everything much clearer for you. So let's have a look first of all at formulation. What are your paints actually made from? So what's in your watercolour paints? Well, it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer and there are lots of little ingredients that you may find in there. There's water, there may be glycerin, there may be honey, but the main three things are pigment, binder and fillers. So the reason these little tubes of colour are quite expensive is because of the pigments mostly. So the pigments could be synthetic or they could be natural pigments, just varies depending on which colour you buy. Now, the next thing you'll find in there is binder. And one of the main ingredients in this tends to be gum arabic. This helps the, uh, it's a natural glue and it helps the paint to stick to the paper. If you open up a tube of paint and all of this clear stuff just oozes out, there's nothing wrong with the paint. It just means that the, uh, the binder has worked its way up to the end and you can just wipe that away and carry on painting. So you can see I've got this gum arabic here and it's actually available as a separate medium. Now, this isn't the video for that. I'll tell you what I use it for in another video, but it's kind of thick and sticky and viscose. And as I said, it's natural, it's non-toxic. It comes from the uh, the acacia tree and it helps to, uh, to bind your watercolors together and to stick them to the paper once you've painted with them. The next thing that you get in them is filler. Now, fillers can be good or bad. Fillers can be used simply to adjust the color or to uh, improve the consistency of the paint. They can also, however, be used in cheap brands to sort of spread out more expensive pigments. And that's why cheap brands can be a little bit dull looking and a little bit opaque looking and not really have that strength of color. Because if a brand is expensive and they want to cut down on, uh, on how much expensive pigment they're using, they want to make a cheaper brand of paint, then they'll put fillers into. So fillers aren't necessarily bad by themselves, but they can be used to reduce the quality of your paint. So let's talk now about synthetic pigments versus natural pigments. So what about those pigments? What about natural pigments compared to synthetic colors? So I've got one of each here. This is a natural pigment color. This is cerulean blue. Now, this pigment may have been altered or heated or changed in some way, but it was based on natural pigments. This one here is a synthetic colour. I know it's synthetic because it has the word quinacridone on, and that's a type of synthetic colour, so I know this one's made from synthetics. So, which is better? The truth is that neither is better or worse than the other. There are very good reasons why people sometimes use synthetic pigments when manufacturing paints. So there could be many reasons. One of the main reasons is that the paint maybe fades. It may be a colour that if you made it from natural pigments, it might fade. It may be that those natural pigments are not available and that you just get a better colour with the synthetic pigments. It may also be that um, there's just such a shortage of the, of the natural version. There have been paints made in the past from very rare minerals and you just can't get hold of them nowadays in sufficient quantities. It would be environmentally damaging to use them as well because there's so few of them left in the world. And so synthetic pigments would be replaced there. So lots of reasons why synthetic pigments are equally as good as um, or can be as good as natural pigments. So don't worry about whether a pigment is natural or synthetic. There's far more important um, indicators of whether it's a good paint or a bad paint than just whether it's natural or synthetic. So the next thing to talk about is granulation. 
So what is granulation? I've picked up here um, a sample that I have when I'm teaching of rough paper. I'll put it close to the camera so that you can see. And there you can see these tiny little um, bits of sediment that are left on show when painting with granulating colours. Now, which colours granulate? As I said, it's more about the pigment than it is about the brand. Ultramarine, for instance, granulates probably more than any other paint. Now, paint granulates because it has larger pigments in that are left on the surface when the rest sinks into the paper. So the colours that granulate tend to be the blues and they tend to be the earth colours. So you get um, cerulean blue and ultramarine blue. Now, this is not to say that all blues granulate. In fact, some blues are incredibly clear and transparent, like phthalo blues. But many of the granulating blues are um, of the granulating colours are blues and also earth colours, and they're literally still made a lot of them from natural pigments and earth. So things like um, you know burnt sienna, burnt umber, things like this um, granulate heavily, and the blues as well, and you get some beautiful effects. So is granulation good or bad? It really depends on what you're looking for in that part of the painting. If you've got an area where you want texture and some of the texture effects that you can get with salt and other things, then granulation is fantastic. If you've got an area that you want to be very smooth and clear and transparent, then obviously granulation is less good. So a few granulating colours in your palette will be lovely. And then you can choose where you want to have them. I've got a video about granulation that explains it in much more depth and gives much more examples of it. I'll link to that one up in the information card so you can have a look at that if you're interested in finding more about granulating pigments. At this point, if you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, I'd be really, really grateful if you could click the like button. YouTube rewards interaction with the audience, so that's likes, comments and shares, and that helps my channel to grow. I can reach more people and teach more people to paint. Let's talk now about some of the most important colours in your box, the transparent staining colours. So which colours are staining colours? Well, we were just looking at cerulean blue and I've painted a patch of it here. Look how weak it is compared to this phthalo blue. Another colour that's very weak is this one here. This is raw umber. And look how weak that is compared to this permanent blue violet. So the staining pigments are the same across the brands. So raw umber is always a weak colour and cerulean blue is always a weak colour as well. There will certainly be brand variations, but these are just made from pigments that aren't as strong. Your strong staining colours tend to be found in the blues, the purples, the reds, the greens. Now, the most common one that you will come across, first of all, would be something like Prussian blue. Any of the phthalo blues and phthalo greens are strong as well, as is Payne's grey. That's another common one. The best way to find out how strong your paints are is always just to swatch them. But I just want you to get this idea of the paints being across the brands and the pigment, as I said, being more important than the brand. So... Cerulean blue is always weak. Phthalo blue is always strong across all brands. So it's easy to look at these weaker pigments and think, well, they're not very nice. I'll just have these strong ones. But actually, you need both within your painting sets, because if you missed out these weaker pigments, you'd be missing an awful lot of colours. And some of them are very beautiful and lights are important as well as darks. But it is equally as important to have some staining colours in your possession so that you can mix really strong darks. If you only had these paler colours, you would never be able to get strong darks and therefore strong contrast within your paintings. Something to be careful of is the fact that staining colours are exactly what they say. They've got tiny pigments, they sink into your paper, they're hard to remove and they're easy to make a mess with because they're just so strong. So when you do start using staining colours, a little bit of restraint is good. I think I ruined every painting that I tried with the when I first got Prussian blue for about the next six months. I was stuffing it in everything and I made a great big mess. So you've got to have a bit of a steady hand when it comes to using your staining pigments, but they are incredibly useful colours. Of course, the opposite of transparent staining colours are semi-opaque colours. So let's look now at opacity. So we've seen that there are some colours that are more transparent than others. This also means that there are some colours that are more opaque. So one of the ones that um, is quite known for being opaque is this one here, which is Naples Yellow. So I'll put a bit of this onto the paper so you can see how it looks. The other ones that tend to be rather opaque are the cadmiums. These have a type of lead in them and they also tend to be rather opaque. 
Now, if you have watercolors that are fully opaque, they are known as gouache or designer's gouache, which is technically a different medium. It's basically watercolor with white painting and all white is opaque. So you get these, uh, these yellows that are more opaque. It's not exclusive to the yellows. Um, some of the cadmium reds as well can be rather opaque as some of the earth colors can be. The best way to tell how opaque these are is to draw a black line on the paper and paint across it. Um, some people do this in their paint swatches and you'll be able to see that you can't see the line through quite as clearly with these more opaque colors. Now there's a common misconception that opaque and semi-opaque watercolors are the cause of muddy paintings and whilst they can be a slight issue if you don't know what you're doing with them they do not cause muddy paintings so I've got another video which I'll link to up at the top in the information cards that tells you all about the causes of muddy paintings it's not as simple as just avoiding these semi opaque colors I really love them I think they've got a real body to them if used carefully they can be really beautiful as part of your palette and so I do recommend that you have a few of these opaque or semi-opaque colors as well. I love the contrast between the semi-opaques and the more transparent colors. Next, we have fugitive pigments. So what is a fugitive color? Well, I always remember it by the film, The Fugitive and He Ran Away. The fugitive colors run away. They basically fade, they disappear from your painting. So when you buy a tube of paint um, or a block of paint, you can usually get um, from the manufacturer, there'll be a permanency rating. It's often um, done by a little series of little crosses or something like that, or little stars. You'll be able to look on your, on your tube of paint and see how permanent it is in terms of fading out in sunlight. Now, eventually given enough time and enough, um, enough centuries and decades, then all paint fades to some extent but some paints fade really really quickly i went to a uh, museum once and looked at a van gogh painting and i thought it looked a bit strange it had these white flowers in a vase and apparently when van gogh painted them they were painted with a rose pigment that faded which is why we now have something called permanent rose so this is what i was saying about synthetic colors being used to reformulate other colors and to be made more permanent however even some of the good brands still sell fugitive colors. Now, why would they do this? So let's look at one that I own here. And this is Daniel Smith Opera Rose. Now, the truth about this pigment is it's a fugitive pigment. It will fade quicker than other pigments. It's also absolutely stunning. There is no way of mixing this Opera Rose pigment in a way that stabilizes it fully and it still has this you know it's it's it almost glows this color which is why i was so attracted to it and why i can't leave it alone now i have a painting in my hallway which i had um, painted some of this color in and it's been there for several years in full sunlight it doesn't look any duller to me so they're not going to fade out in a week you also have to consider when using using fugitive pigments what your um overall aim for the painting is are you doing it to sell a fine art painting or perhaps you're doing an illustration it's going to be reproduced anyway in which case the original is of less importance there are all sorts of elements that you can add to a painting particularly i'm thinking of things like collage which will fade over time so it's a decision you have to make whether you want any of these fugitive pigments within your palette i'm going to tell you now about single pigment colors so let's talk about single pigment colors now. So single pigment colors are exactly what they sound like. They are a paint that is formulated with just one pigment in. Does this mean they're all the same? Now I have here Cerulean Blue from Daniel Smith and Cerulean Blue from Talons. Are they identical? Well, they're made from the same pigment, the exact same pigment. Does this mean they are the same? No, it does not. The, uh, the best way I can think of describing it to you is if you had two apples, um, two different species of apples, they would be strongly similar. You would bite into it and you would know that it was an apple. It would look and taste and seem very much like an apple. But would one apple be the same as another apple, even within the same sort of species of apple? Maybe it wouldn't. So when you have single pigment colors, you have a lot of similarity between brands all types of ultramarine, for instance, are going to look very, very similar across the brands, but they may not be 
identical. Now the other reason for variations is that natural pigments, even though they're the same pigment, they do vary. And the best way I can think of explaining that to you is if you think of a diamond. So we all know that we get some, you dig up some diamonds and they're absolutely stunning and fabulous and worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. And then you might dig up other diamonds and they're just not very good, but they have the same chemical component. So it can be a matter of um, where the pigments are acquired from. Obviously, some countries and some sources may have better quality of those pigments than other sources. It's also about the way that your paint is prepared. If we go back to diamonds, I remember reading that they'd found I don't know, the world's largest diamond or something, and they were looking for somebody that was good enough to cut the diamond because however good the diamond was, if it was cut badly, it would have become worthless. So it's also about how the pigments are prepared. But the thing to remember about single pigment colours is they're going to be very similar across all of the brands, but that doesn't mean, say, they're going to be identical. And when they are single pigments, doesn't even mean they're going to be the same pigments. So this pigment here, I'm going to look it up now because I can't remember. It's PB, PB35. But I think cerulean blue, and I'm just uh, I'm just making this up out of my own head, and I think cerulean blue is also mixed from PB36. But anyway, there are definitely two versions of cerulean blue. Don't quote me about pigment numbers. I may have got that wrong. But there are two versions of pigments that can be used for cerulean blue. But if you have single pigment colours, they're going to be very similar across your brands. After single pigment colours, of course, we have mixed pigment colours. So we looked at single pigment colours, let's look at mixed pigment colours. So if single pigment colours are like apples, then mixed pigment colours are like cakes. So you might have a chocolate cake and you might have a fruit cake. They're both cake, aren't they? And we know that all cake is definitely good cake. However, there's a lot of difference between them. There's a lot of different ingredients in there. And that's what a mixed pigment colour is. It's a colour that has multiple pigments in. It's basically what the manufacturer decides it should be. And this means that there's a lot more variation. You may get the same name across brands. You may get something like Emerald Green. And the name incidentally is a little bit of a clue. For instance, this one here, look at this Primrose Yellow. We've got Emerald Green. Um, what have I got here? Ocean Blue. Don't even know where that came, came from actually. Somebody gave me that, obviously. So the colors can sometimes um, be a little bit more indistinct sounding. So if you've got raw umber, it sounds very much like a single pigment, doesn't it? What about Payne's Grey? So I've got two versions of Payne's Grey here. Payne's Grey was invented by somebody called Payne's and um, it's basically a very strong, dark, staining blue-grey. It's a useful colour. So let's have a look at it. Here it is. This is Talon's Rembrandt Payne's Grey. However, there's no fixed recipe for Payne's Grey. It's just what the manufacturer decides it looks like. So look at this one here. Here we have SAA Payne's Grey. Look at the difference. Weaker, more opaque, and a lot more purple. So I'll hold them close to the camera so you can see. It's very dark here in England at the moment. Got a lot of rain going on. But you can see there's a huge amount of difference between those colours. And this is, as I said, that because the manufacturer just decide to put in what they want to put in. So let me show you at this point how this affects my own work, this difference between brands with the same colours. So this is a painting I'm working on at the moment. It's going to be um, tulips. And I want this kind of soft focus background. Now, before I even start, I'm going to consider which colours I'll be using for the tulips so that I can use those colours in the background because I'm working within this limited palette. That's not about using um, very few colours. It's more about sticking with the same colour palette throughout the painting so that I get this lovely sense of unity to it. So I'm looking at these tulips initially, which are the main focus of the painting, and seeing which colours I need. So of course I'm trying out my colours on scraps of paper to see which pinks, which reds, which oranges, which yellows. And I'm immediately thinking to myself, well, cadmium yellow deep would be, um, would be a possibility. So I've got two brands. This is the one that I've had for years, which is um, Talon's Rembrandt. It's one of my favourite brands. So if I swatch a little bit of that for you, you'll be able to see the colour of it. It's a very warm yellow that tends almost in towards um, orange, which is why I thought that it might be appropriate for this painting. And there it is. 
and certainly I do see that it would be appropriate for this painting but of course I continue swatching I've got several oranges as well and several pinks and several reds I've just been sent this one here which is Jackman's art materials do keep watching the video because um, later on in this video I'll be trialing out some of their shimmering uh, iridescent paints and I have got a discount code for you but let me show you what this one looks like too so if I place it here well that's interesting I hope you can see the difference there the Jackman's is rather more orange and you actually can see the difference more when they're watered down so this one goes much more into yellow and this one goes much more into orange so when I was swatching these colors getting ready to start this painting I actually looked at these two colors and thought you know what I see them both in my painting because there certainly are those warm sort of orange yellows but also there are these um, bright sort of sunshine egg yolky yellows as well so I decided to use both of these in my painting now it may be that if you're a beginner you have far fewer colors than this so don't think that you have to have hundreds of colors I'm very lucky in that manufacturers send them to me students give them to me as gifts um, I just acquire them sometimes when I do demonstrations at art clubs I'm given some of the colors that they want me to demonstrate so I have a lot of paints but if you for instance um, had this one but not this one you could add more yellow um, if you had this one but not this one you could add a bit more orange or a bit more red and adjust them so you don't need hundreds of colors but this is just to tell you about the difference between manufacturers it's also important and these are equally good paints by the way they're both very beautiful colors there's nothing wrong with either of them happy to use both of them but they're certainly as you can see from the picture they're not the same and this is about when you are um, using, perhaps you've got a small set of paints and you have maybe eight or ten colours. If there's a colour in there that you really aren't very happy with and you don't like very much, why not try some um, from other manufacturers? You can often get samples. If you're going to art shops, you can often get um, dot cards as well, which give you just a little bit of each paint dried for you to trial out. Obviously, at the moment with the coronavirus, it's hard to get into art shops. But you may also, if you contact manufacturers um, on the internet, you may be able to get some sample cards there too. So if you've got a colour in your box and you just think, I like all my colours, but this one just never seems very good, you can then look at other manufacturers and look at the same colour in other brands. You'll be amazed. There's a lot of difference between them. Far from essential, but really good fun. Next, we're going to talk about pearlescent and shimmering colours. So let's look now at shimmering or sparkling or iridescent colours. They're the butterflies of the paint world. They're completely unnecessary, but they're absolutely beautiful. So these are something that you can add into your palette if you want to. And I've just actually been sent some samples um, to try out. So I've got these from Jackman's Art Materials. And I thought while I'm making this video, I'd swatch some of them for you. So the thing with these sparkling or iridescent pigments is... They're manufactured to look really pretty alone. Of course, you could add them to other colours. I'll, um, I'll bring these up to the camera in a moment. This is uh, this iridescent pearlescent copper. Of course, you could mix them with other colours, but they, are generally, they generally look best when they're swatched alone like this. So I tend to use them towards the end of my painting or just to add shimmer in certain areas I tend not to layer them with other colors because all you're going to do really is dilute the amount of shimmer that's been put in them and you have to experiment with them really they can sometimes look stronger when um, put in several layers you know layered um, several layers of the same color layered one on top of the other so this is silver pearlescent silver shimmer see what else I've got here this one I was really really looking forward to trying this is rose gold so sometimes they look more shimmery layered on quite thickly but then other times I've found with some of them and I've used the uh, I've used the Daniel Smith ones as well sometimes they actually can look more sparkly if they're put on quite thinly you can of course layer them on top of other colors as well let's put some on top of this color here because obviously if you've got a shimmer in there you're going to have a certain amount of opacity to them as well so that's my advice to you with the shimmer paints that's a beautiful color isn't it let's try I'm just going to try 
one more golden orange shimmer let's try this one so my advice to you is to treat these almost as a decorative thing and put them in simple sort of single areas I sometimes fill in areas of background with these pearlescent paints that's beautiful isn't it it looks a lot like the um, the yellow I was using earlier look at that it's quite close isn't it not at all what I was expecting I can't resist actually I'm just going to swatch one more and that's the uh, the pearlescent gold because it'd be interesting to see it next to the uh, next to the orange there I'm just taking a little bit out of the lids of these to be honest they sent them to me about 10 days ago and they've just been in the post the whole time we, we didn't know what had happened to them the uh, the post in England at the moment is um, is quite crazy so there's your shimmer colours. They can be quite hard to see on camera. I'm going to lift them up now so you can see. Hopefully you can see them sparkling and shimmering. They're absolutely beautiful. Now if you would like a discount on these Jackman's paints, you'll find if you go into the video description, there's lots of things in there for you. Um, one of the things that's in there for you is a discount code with my name. And so if you put that code in, and um, I'll put the website there for you as well. You can get 10% off, not just these shimmer colors, these pearlescent colors, but also all of the colors that Jackmans have. They're a new little British brand, and they are, um, every week they seem to invent new colors, and they've got brushes there as well. So if you'd like a discount off of these colors or any other colors, do pop into the video description. You can also grab my free um, downloadable PDFs in there and lots of other good things. So shimmering and pearlescent colours, they're not necessary for your general colour mixing, but they're a really, really lovely addition to your box, especially if you do things like, I love them for flower painting, they may not be entirely realistic, but I love them for flower painting. And also if you do things like crafts or make greetings cards or anything like that, to have a few of these shimmery watercolours is really, really a beautiful addition to your painting box. Finally, let's talk briefly about white paint. Now, when you first start painting, somebody will always say to you that watercolour is a transparent medium and that you mustn't use white paint. And they have a point, but we shouldn't be too sniffy about white paint because the earliest watercolourists actually used white paint, which they also body colour, all the time. People like Turner used white paint. However, beginners can get into a mess with it. Now, I did a video um, which was three colours that you shouldn't use when you start painting. I'll put a link to it up above. And one of those colours was white. It's not necessarily that there's anything wrong with using white, but it's just that it's more important to understand how to use tra watercolour transparently before you introduce white. Now, I was taken to task once uh, recently when I said in a video that I considered all watercolour to be, uh, all white watercolour to be gouache paint because gouache is opaque and all white is opaque. And somebody came on and said, well, no, because watercolour white tends to be more transparent and um, um, gouache white tends to be more opaque. And although this is true, it's really not an exact rule and manufacturers don't even stick to it because the, um, the transparent white is sometimes used in, in gouache paints and the more opaque whites are sometimes used in, in watercolours. So you really can't tell. So what I would say to you about white paint is when you start watercolour painting, don't mix it into anything, everything. Don't use it just to lighten your colours because it's not the way you lighten watercolours. If I show you, um, we'll go back to the, uh, the Payne's Grey here and I'll just add a bit more water to it. So I haven't got any white paint here, but you can see I can get that colour really pale. The same with any colour, actually. Let's just grab something randomly. From my palette, I think this is Talon's Rembrandt Cadmium Red Light. Now, the more water I add to it, the paler it gets. So you do not need white paint. You also shouldn't be just dumping white paint on top of your paintings to cover up your mistakes. However, there are some good uses of white paint. And I'll link to the video that I did all about the good uses of white paint at the end of this video so that you can have a look at that one if you'd like to know some really, really interesting and effective ways of using white within your watercolours. But don't just randomly grab white and mix it through everything because it is opaque and you will make all of your, um, your other colours more opaque by mixing white into them. 
For those of you who have watched all the way to the end of this video, thank you so much and thank you for subscribing to me on YouTube. My channel is growing really fast now, so I'm super excited. As many of you know, I lost about two thirds of my income recently with the coronavirus because I'm no longer able to teach the, uh, the vast amount of classes and courses that I was teaching before. So it's lovely to find new ways of reaching you on the internet. Thanks so much as well for those of you who have supported me on Patreon. I really, really appreciate you. If you're interested in finding out what other content you can get from me on Patreon, do click the link in the description. It'll take you over there and you can see all the different tier levels and what you get for each level. And it really, really helps me to keep this channel going and to support all of the other things that I do as well. If you're interested in my video on using white paint effectively, you can watch that video right now.